Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we welcome a special guest and that's the host of the What Bitcoin Did podcast, Dr. Peter McCormack. How are you going, mate? <laughs> I'm alright, mate. How are you? Oh, I'm really good. I'm really looking forward to today. I think your story is just such a fascinating one and um, you've become a bit of a rock star in the crypto world of late. So for those that haven't followed your story, um, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Peter McCormack. I am the host of What Bitcoin Did. Um, I'm kind of noisy guy, makes a lot of noise doing his podcast, and uh, I'm probably very different in real life than I am on Twitter. But uh, yeah, hi, thanks for having me on. We we're probably we're like te- fully testing the the boundary of tech here, right? We couldn't be further apart on this planet. Yeah, I was just saying I've actually spent a bit of time in England, but it's about as far as you can fly anywhere on this planet as well. And we've actually uh, got pretty bad internet in Australia normally, so I'm glad that this is uh, all working well so far. Yeah, it's working well, dude. So, so what's your background, Pete? What have you done in your life? Tell us about this story. Where does it all start? Um, uh, gosh, how do I explain my, my background? Um, so I my background's just normal, really, dude, like probably probably like yours grew up with a brother and sister and a mum and dad who loved me and treated me very well and put me in a good school and yeah just a very good parents um very supportive of how I always was probably my mum more than my dad my dad always worries about me but my mum was always uh, supported always did support me before she passed away a- a- anything I wanted to do always been entrepreneurial always liked doing my own thing I had a fanzine when I was about 14 15 used to interview bands um go to concerts and interview bands I interviewed Metallica no not Metallica uh, Slayer Pantera Biohazard lots of old metal bands Korn yeah. uh, went to uni hated it dropped out learned how to code websites I got into web development and then had my own web agency um, that spectacularly collapsed after my divorce and quite heavy uh, drug addiction and stumbled across Bitcoin and other shit coins did some trading wasn't very good at it and then started a podcast and here i am like two and a half years after finding bitcoin that day fantastic so yeah i was going to ask you when did that all start was it uh blockchain or was it bitcoin or was it old coins what did you find first well actually it was 2013 it was silk road where you could buy cocaine and when you were buying cocaine it would have it reviewed by all the people who bought of it which was a revolution because as anybody who's taken drugs in the past that um there are a couple of problems you face um the logistics of buying drugs is terrible (laughs) because it's illegal you know so you have to meet some dodgy character and you they never turn up on time and it's really frustrating and then also when you're buying, you don't know what you're buying. You can buy very low quality or you can buy stuff which is cut with horrible impurities. I don't take drugs anymore. I'm uh, I'm a recovering addict um, probably f- over four years now uh, clean. But I would never hold it against anyone who wants to take drugs. Um, you know, our bodies, we should do it as we choose. But uh, the Silk Road solved the problem. Um you know the logistics were different you had to plan in advance but that was fine but the quality of what you were buying was very good and it was a much safer way to buy drugs i mean buying drugs in kind of middle class westernized countries is quite safe anyway i mean yeah you know it's not like the it's not like the wire in baltimore where anyone might shoot you in the face and the, at the time will beat the shit out of you um but at the same time, the Silk Road to me created a better version of the world, and it, you know where drug prohibition has failed, it created a, a much safer environment for people to buy drugs. And to do so, you have to have Bitcoin, right? And so that was when I first discovered Bitcoin. But Bitcoin for me was a tool then, just for buying. I didn't didn't really understand it. I wasn't into Austrian economics or libertarianism, and it, to me, it was just some weird internet money. Um, but so, you know traded a bit back then lost some money made some money nothing really spectacular and then didn't do anything for it as the prices crashed after mount gox i didn't do anything with it until late 2016 when my mum was you know close to death from cancer and i'd been trying for a while to encourage trying cannabis as a solution as a treatment and she wanted to you know she agreed my father agreed and i was like well dad i know how to do it so uh, Googled how to buy Bitcoin, ended up on Coinbase, bought some Bitcoin, and that's how I came back into it. 
Yeah, you've touched on so many good points there, Peter. Well, first of all, um, congratulations on your sobriety, but I completely agree that that marketplace that it created, and if people haven't used it, it's a lot like re- uh, eBay where people have a reputation and you can trust your drug dealer, and it's that word, trust that Bitcoin allows without ever meeting someone. So, yeah, I think the drug should be legal and it's all about getting education and standardization out there and the world would be a much better place. The war on drugs has completely failed, I think, if you'd asked anyone. And when you look at those European countries that have taken these friendlier models and really focused on rehab and giving people meaning in their life and a job, the outcomes are far better. I mean, just look what's happened out in the US now since they've uh, many of the states have legalized marijuana. Look at how it's become professionalized. I was in LA recently and I was down on, what's the name of the road? Abbott Kenny. I've taken to a weed shop, which was a bit like an Apple store where you had vape pens, you had gummies, you had treats, you had different uh, types of uh, uh, marijuana that you could buy. It's suddenly gone from that uh, when I was growing up where you would you know hide in the park or you know, just or go around someone's house when their parents were and sit in the garden, and and it felt illegal and naughty, and and um, and now it's gone to this stage where it's professionalised. You know, but on a Friday night you can, or any night really, but on a Friday night you might rather than get a bottle of wine, you might go and buy some weed and go home and chill out. And uh, the 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 way it's been professionalised is amazing, but it's also caused this cultural shift where marijuana has gone from being seen as a drug and a gateway drug to other drugs to just being part of life and i i would uh i would challenge anyone to find a, a weed head who is going out and smoking a, a a spliff and then getting into a fight like they might with alcohol i think i was trying to explain it to my son recently because he thinks of marijuana as a drug and drugs are bad and i was trying to explain to him you know drugs come in all shapes and sizes they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, alcohol is a drug, and um, I wouldn't. I, I'm not classing things really, but yeah, marijuana doesn't really do any damage to society. But what does it do? It helps with anxiety, mm. right? People who can't sleep or suffer from insomnia uh, will may have a vape pen and sleep better. It helps with epilepsy. It does so many good things to help people, and there's really little downside to it. So, yeah, I think. Uh, I think marijuana has proved that there can be a better world if we treat drugs a bit more realistically. It's one of the problems with the world today is that there's certain topics that are taboo and we're not even allowed to talk about them. And I'm not sure if you've watched the documentary uh, A Leaf of Faith about uh, Kratom, that plant that's helping all the opiate addicts in America. And so the government are try- no, I haven't. trying to make it illegal. And it's this plant that's uh, grown in Bali um, yeah, throughout Asia. And it's like a miracle cure. With a- it doesn't sound to me like there's a lot of downside. But uh, the first thing big pharma do is come after you and try and make that illegal. Yeah. Um, I mean, the opiate problem in the States is just insane. Um, you know, I was reading about recently there was uh, a survivor of the Columbine massacre who took his life. Um he had been prescribed uh, opiates. Is it oxytocin? Oxycontin. Yeah. I mean, I could, uh, yeah, I could have the facts wrong, but uh, was pre- prescribed that was unable for a long time to get off his addiction, and then he ended up ended up being somebody who campaigned and taught people about addictions, but then ended up taking his life. And the opiate problem in the U.S. is fucking insane, and this is being prescribed by doctors, but yet you have places like the U.K. where we've got there was a the family of a, a young girl who was epileptic. They'd gone to Amsterdam. They'd bought a bunch of marijuana to help treat, treat her epilepsy. They got back to the UK and it was confiscated. I mean, what bollocks is that? A young girl who has epilepsy who's taken this, but she can't. I mean, it's just such bollocks. Hopefully the world grows up. But um, what are some of the stigmas? I think just hate that word addict as well. And I've helped a lot of people um, in pharmacy and whatnot. But what are some of the misconceptions? And you know, what did you experience, or did you hide yours a lot of the time, or how did that all play out? Um, so it crept up on me. Uh, it was a social drug. Um, I didn't didn't take a lot of drugs in my early life. This was something that came on later life working in advertising. And then um, it crept up on me. And then I went through quite a brutal divorce and just suddenly became an addict. I didn't realize I was an addict until, you know, quite late on. I still still thought I had control of it. Because one of the weird things about like a cocaine addiction is it's not like you wake up every day and think, oh, I need a fix, like in the films. 
Yeah. Uh, it doesn't work like that. I would go to work, perhaps a couple of days wouldn't do it, but it was became more of a crutch for me for depression. When I was mm. feeling shit, I would score and I would just get off my face. Um, the tipping There were two tipping points specifically. The first one was, I remember one night, uh, I was on my own at home and I was doing it, but I was, I, I got high and then I felt fucking terrible and I was doing a line to get back to normal. So I wasn't even trying to get to high, just feeling normal and then I feel okay and then I feel shit. And I was like, fuck, I'm an addict now. I I'm, I'm, need this to not feel terrible. As one of the worst nights of my life. Uh, just getting through that night was awful. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. It was terrible. The second time was when I did it and it triggered an, S an SVT, which is um, a heart rate over 200 beats per minute. And I think that was the last time I ever did it because I ended up in an ambulance um, to hospital. So um, the stigmas that go with it, I think explaining it to my father was difficult. I think he had the, I think he sees the picture of what they see in the films. Yeah. You know, you think train spotting, you think people injecting themselves and in scuzzy homes and, you know, uh, I know a lot of people who take drugs and they live very normal lives and hold, hold, you know, very professional jobs. Um, but there's good stigmas and bad stigmas, right? I mean, there's stigmas that are all drugs are bad, which is a, is a terrible stigma. Um, you know, if we're going to say that, we should say alcohol is bad. I mean, alcohol kills so many people, yeah. brutal, brutalizes your liver and causes a lot of violence and uh, a lot of people, like, loses up a lot of the resources of the police and the NHS in the UK. Um, but I don't know. I, I haven't really answered your question. I've just talked about being an abuser. <laughs> <laughs> what was your what was your what's your story? Well, I guess I've got a lot of uh, people that I saw on the front lines at pharmacy who come in for their daily dosing. And when you're that twenty year old kid that graduates and you've got the picture in your head of what addicts are, and we, you know we use drugs socially throughout uni and stuff, never hardcore drugs, but um, yeah, the people that you meet that are these addicts that are coming in for their methadone and whatnot, and they're normal people, and they're guys that've been to jail, but they love their family, and they come in with their five year old son while they're dosing, and then you realise, geez, this. These people don't want to be addicts. These people want a normal life, but they're chemically hooked to these substances. Yeah. I think people just, ex I think a lot of people who don't understand drugs will classify abusers of drugs as being like a lower class citizen. Yeah. Or, you know, people who are struggling in life. They're not. Um, it's just, I don't, I don't think we should ever categorize it. Um, I wouldn't encourage people to take drugs after my experience. I, I don't think it's healthy for you, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't object to anyone if you know what I mean. And yeah. I, you know, certainly things like marijuana and, and mushrooms, I've never taken mushrooms, but they seem to be fine. Don't seem to cause too many problems. I wouldn't encourage anyone to uh, get into a habit of taking cocaine or, uh, or heroin because you know, they're troubling drugs that usually have a poor outcome. But at the same time, I don't think prohibition changes it. And I would wonder whether um, if we ha all drugs were decriminalized, people would use them less, I wonder. I think that's I, that what I'm the, not sure of. That's what the, the data shows. But I guess my hope is just yeah, the stigma around all this goes and we get a lot of cool research into LSD and mushrooms and medical marijuana. And I think there's going to be a lot of breakthroughs there and we're going to completely view these substances uh, differently in the in the future but um well and mdma is now being used to treat uh ptsd in um soldiers yeah exactly um yeah. and e ecstasy has been used to de treat depression in the past so you know i think we need to be open-minded about the benefits that these things can have but sadly i think what it, this comes down to a lot of these problems come down to political careers it's very it's not socially acceptable for a politician to say we should legalize all drugs because because they have a fear of not getting their vote and that affects their political career and i think a lot of the problems in the world are driven by political careers rather than the better of society yeah. which is you know which is the form of democracy we have right now yeah well moving on from that pete how did that change your outlook on life or business after you went through all that um I'm not sure it did. I mean, the the real kicker was, you know, thinking of my children. I mean, just imagine I fucking overdosed on, you know, had a heart attack or something and died and my kids had grown up knowing their dad died from taking drugs. I mean, what a shit life that would have been for them and what a terrible dad I would have been. So that was the real kicker and 
I knew I had to be around for my children. So that that was a didn't really change anything about my life. Didn't change it. I've always worked hard and been entrepreneurial and uh, always on the edge of hoping to have some minor success with what I do. Um, but no, it didn't really change anything about um, about that at all. No, no. I I mean, I just don't do drugs anymore, and I advise people not to. And I'm definitely more compassionate to people who do have an addiction. Yeah. And I think I'm better for have been through it, but um, it's not really changed my outlook on work. Uh, no, no. Like, I mean, my outlook on life is different these days. But I think that's, I think that's part of getting older. How old are you? <laughs> uh, thirty-one. Thirty-one. Yeah. Oh, you're a bit younger than me, so I'm yeah. forty now. And uh, priorities change. Uh, you know, you start to value your time a lot more. And yeah, I'm very lucky to be in a position where you know I can pick my hours so i'm around for my children when i need to be but uh no that that didn't that hasn't really changed my outlook much at all um yeah, yeah. No. do you do you want to talk about your uh the cycle you went through with the crypto bull market and you pretty you spoke really openly about the money you made and then and then you lost and do you think that has you know a lot of similarities to maybe that addictive personality and people do get that same rush from trading or do you think that was just a few bad decisions or how did that all play out yeah I mean, the funny thing about any of these things, when you're transparent about them, you you can find a lot of people who empathize with it, but yeah. you will find also people who use it against you. So the trading one's really interesting because the amount of times like oh, someone wants to have a like pop at me on Twitter, they'll say, oh, why are you listening to this idiot? He lost all his money trading, blah, blah, blah. Firstly, I didn't lose it all. Secondly is the amount of people that went through this same cycle was incredible. Oh, yeah. It feels like you hear about this stat that only like that ninety percent of people lose money on trading, right? It feels like a very few, a low percentage of people actually cashed out and profit from that run. When I put out that tweet store, I must have I had hundreds of people DM me to say, I went through the same, this is my story, smaller amounts, larger amounts. Um I don't think that is much certainly you got a, I got a rush from it, but I don't I th- I just think I was out of my depth. I was doing something I didn't understand. I thought it would go up forever. You know, people say, oh, you should have cashed out. But at what point? I mean, when I doubled my money, that's amazing. Yeah. So I could have cashed out at, uh, you know, 50 grand. <laughs> you know, you never know when it was going to stop. So I just sat with it. And, you know, I'd love to change what I did, but you can't. I, every single day I've made the best decision for me at that time. And, you know, so be it. I made and lost some money trading, but I've got a podcast out of it and a new career. So, like in the grand scheme of things, I'm you know I'm fine with it all. Yeah, I'm a big um, believer. But I think, big believer in karma. Yeah. Everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it, it is what it is. You know, um, made and lost some money. Okay. Yeah, some people will want to like shit on you for that, but like life is good. I, it's, this has changed my life. I, I get to travel the world and, and interview people. I get like today. I I could be sat in an office doing a boring job. But I'm here chatting to you. I've not met you before. You're in Australia. I'm pretty sure if I ever head over, we can meet up, have a beer. And what a, these things are really cool. And th- these are the things that have come out of it. Um, I do think it should be a big warning for other people though, because most likely by the time another bull run happens, it will start above Hmm. the the next um, market cycle bottom. So a lot of people will come in and they'll watch it go up and then they'll watch it come down and they will lose money. And I, you know, not everyone can make money, but I just think there should be nice warnings out there for people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I completely agree with getting to meet nice people. I was really unhappy at my job with a pharmacist and now uh, I love work every day and I can do it from home with my uh, new little boy as well. But statistically speaking... Oh, how old is he? Uh, 11 weeks old. So. Oh shit, man! Is yeah. that your first? Yeah, don't speak too loud. He's in the room next door. Yeah, uh, he, he won't <laughs> understand that. Okay, I guess that's your wife in the background there. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yeah. Oh wow, cool. Well, look, congratulations on that. Thanks, <laughs> How are you finding it? Yeah, oh, super busy. It's a lot like crypto, waking up five times a night. It's mad, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> listen, it's the, it's the most fun you'll ever have. It's also a massive pain in the ass. I mean, my son's 15 now. Um, sorry, I've just uh, derailed the conversation. <laughs> no, you're right. I was just going to say, yeah, a lot of people thought that 3,000 was the top, then five and 10,000. And statistically speaking, there's only going to be a very small percent of people that ever sell that, you know, that big green candle that you see on the chart. So I think people being able to um, relate to your story was what made it so fantastic when I read about it. So congratulations on that. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's funny in hindsight. Like I had a I had a bit of regret after doing it, but I think I know it helped a lot of people. Um, and I know a lot of people. I think a lot of people just took solace in it, right? Yeah, they've been through the same, and and they realise it. They're just not. It's not that they're an idiot. That this affected a lot of people, and uh, yeah, I'm glad I did it. So talk about uh, Bitcoin maximalism and your sort of journey and and your current thoughts on all that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, this is something I'm really wrestling with at the moment. So I'm pretty sure that five years time, most of this shit will be gone and Bitcoin will still be here. Um, It kind of makes sense to me, but I can't get there without asking questions or kind of navigating my way. And, And it's it's no by no means definite that Bitcoin will be there itself, but uh, I'm pretty sure that all this other stuff is nonsense. You know, I look at, you know, I look at something like Ripple, and, and no one's given me a compelling reason to own it or what it does. I, I look at something like Ethereum, and it just seems so complicated. And yeah, lots of devs are working on it, but what are they actually building that mainstream people will use? Most of it is just kind of nonsense. Whereas I look at Bitcoin, I'm like, well, that makes sense. It isn't actually that complicated. Like it's complicated to understand it, but to start, first start using it to buy some on Coinbase or Kraken or wherever and transfer to a hardware wallet isn't that complicated. Yeah, and I'm kind of, I kind of empathise massively with Bitcoin maximalism, but I'm just not there myself. And as somebody's producing content, I think it's dangerous to be a maximalist because. Yeah, I think it's important to open your eyes and just recognize other things that are happening. And, you know, I did an interview with Andrew Polstra, which is going live today, the guy from Blockstream, and he was saying how they talk to the Litecoin guys or the Zcash guys, and they talk about different implementations of technology, what they're doing. There's a lot of collaboration there. Mm. And so I think there are some outline benefits for other cryptocurrencies existing. Whether they will all exist in the future, I don't know. Um, I think it's... I think think bitcoin benefits from having very hardcore maximalists who keep it yeah. in check and keep people in check at the same time it can be brutal and it's not for everyone so i've kind of got multiple feelings on it so i was a bitcoin maximalist from 2012 to 2015 and then i finally took the time to really learn about ethereum and i know what you're saying that there's nothing there's no killer dApps that are being used at the moment but I think they're sort of building those pipes to, to really build that Web 3.0 that they're aiming for in the future. And then we have those other coins like Light, um, Litecoin that's going to act as a bit of a test net. And then we have individual use cases. So maybe maybe gambling turns out that it is good for with blockchain as the backbone and Funfair, for example, takes off. So I'm not sure, but one thing I've learned in life is to uh, remain open-minded. And it, uh, I just think that the Bitcoin maximalists uh, are sort of saying to everyone else, thousands of people working out there that, no, we know better. And then it almost reminds me of how the bankers are saying, no, you can't use Bitcoin. Well, these guys are turning around to the people that are experimenting with something new and saying, no, that'll never work. Yeah, so I agree with you like ideologically that you know, free market and people should do what they want. But at the same time, I kind of look at it all and I, you know, I think we're trying to find a home for blockchains and the homes aren't there. Uh, that... I find it concerning that after after this many years that Ethereum really doesn't have killer dApps. It was ICOs, but they've turned out to be nonsense. <laughs> uh, I've read about ETH2 and the big upgrades coming. It just sounds scary, this, the bloat and the size of this thing they want to build. And I just think, what what, what is this? Um, I think Litecoin as a test net, I think that's a myth because Bitcoin has a test net. Uh, are there benefits? Maybe there are. I, I, I'm not too sure, but... I've kind I've kind of got to the point now where I'm like, okay, Bitcoin has a purpose. You know, I have a use case for it. It makes sense for me. I think the world needs it. Like I I used it today. Uh, yeah, you know, I invoiced a company in the US and they paid me in Bitcoin because it's easier. That's cool for me. Yeah. I'm going to the Oslo Freedom Forum um, this weekend. I'm hosting a panel about Bitcoin called Bitcoin Around the World, which is about how Bitcoin is enabling f- for better freedom in certain countries. So I, I'm kind of I'm there with Bitcoin. I'm still. I'm not there with anything else. So for me, uh, they're a distraction, but I don't close the door completely. Yeah, okay. But they are a distraction. So I would happily interview and speak to people on other projects if I thought there was something of interest, but I'm not going to buy anything else right now. 
I, I still think that Bitcoin is king as well. By the way, just uh, just not a maximalist. Right. And when I actually had to buy a cricket bat off someone back in England, it was two hundred dollars, and it cost me something like fifty dollars in transfer fees and a twenty dollar exchange rate. It cost me like two hundred and seventy dollars, and that's when I was like begging this guy to accept Bitcoin, but it was too early back then. And that was just nah. a, a really basic, real world example of oh, I wish we could use Bitcoin because that's what it's good for, as you say. Well, yeah. I mean, if I invoice a company out in the US and they pay me bank to bank, I have to pay 3.2% above the uh, interest rate, which I get charged by the bank. Yeah, if I just get paid in Bitcoin, I just get paid in Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, I have to like risk you know, volatility and other things, but it just it's just an easier, better world. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on Lightning Network at the moment, Pete? Have you done much research into that? I saw you've interviewed some cool guests lately about that as well. Yeah, yeah. So I did a whole month of shows about Lightning and my kind of conclusion, TLDR, is that it's very exciting. It promises a lot. Uh, I think user experience-wise, there, there's uh, we've got there's some way to go. That I found the custodial experience is better than non-custodial, but that's kind of antithetical to Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, I think there's lots of questions that haven't been answered yet. Um, but overall, I'm, I'm I'm like I'm excited about it. I, I want to use it. I, I don't actually have a need for it right now. That's the funny thing. Yeah. Um, I have a need for Bitcoin and the base chain, but most of my transactions are multi thousands of pounds because they're invoices. I don't have a huge need for small transactions, and even with that, I'm kind of happy with my you know Dropbit wallet that I present people people Bitcoin with. Um, I think probably more a more regular use of. Litecoin, where uh, sorry, Lightning, where it's a little bit more integrated with other wallets. I think maybe is maybe a year, even two years away. And when it comes, I'll use it. Uh, I think a lot of the complexities need abstracting away, but I think it offers a lot. I think it's uh, has a lot of potential. Um, I just think it, we're not there yet. Have you heard of Wallet of Satoshi, the Australian guys? It's meant to be the world's friendliest Lightning wallet, so it, it really is awesome. No. And uh, we had a meetup the other day, and I had a 63-year-old guy come up and just say, I want to give you $10, and he got out a Lightning wallet and did it. Um, it is a custody nice. one, but uh, that to me was just a real a real world example of a 63-year-old paying in Lightning. Yeah, I mean, Blue Wallet's custodial. I've used that, and that's kind of works Very okay. Smart, but yeah. yeah, we shouldn't like. I did an interview with Zach Mallers from Zap, uh, Jack Mallers from Zap, and he he's he's not happy with the growth and push for custodial solutions. Now, I think it's kind of expected and yeah. and you know acceptable right now. But ideally, you know, we will go to non-custodial. But this world of non-custodial wallets. Of Bitcoin alongside Lightning, people running full nodes and Lightning nodes. I think that's a big leap for a lot of people, yeah. and uh, I'm not sure that is for everyone. So, talking about your podcast, um, how's are that going? And I mean, as a YouTube channel, we made the decision not to do any ICO promotion because it was just the wild west out there. And now we yeah. have some trusted partners like exchanges that we know that we let sponsor our podcast and so on. So, how's your journey been running a podcast as a business in this space? Uh, great. I mean, mostly great. Um, the the bad side is dealing with criticism and trolls. And look, I control people as well. But yeah, I find it hard. Like when you know yourself and you're trying to do things honestly and put something together honestly and do your best job possible, when people don't agree or think you're lying or make stuff up about you, I've, I've always found that really hard to deal with. Cause, and now I just have to accept it and I'm trying to let it just flick off me. Um but I love producing the show. I've got some great sponsors. I've never turned down so much money in my life, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. The, the amount of times I'm getting inquiries, I'm like, I just, I just can't accept your money. It's you know, what you're doing is incredible. What you're doing sound doesn't sound right, or what you're doing, my audience wouldn't be happy with. So, yeah, yeah I've turned down so much money. <laughs> Sometimes you're like, oh, wish I didn't have to, but um, yeah, no, it's the right thing. Um, but you know, I get challenged on my, you know, some of my sponsors anyway. I mean, some people aren't huge fans of BlockFi because they believe their interest accounts is antithetical to Bitcoin because you're trusting somebody else with your Bitcoin. Hmm. I My view is that this is a future of financial services and they sell risk and I'm okay with that. Yeah. Some people don't like, I mean, look, there are, there are, Bucking idiots everywhere will find a problem with something. Or <laughs> yeah. um, but mostly, uh, like the whole experience is is amazing. Like, it's, yeah. it's the best job I've ever had. 
So who have been some of your best guests or the best stories you've had on there? Uh, I mean, my my fa- one of my favorite experiences was my third interview where I went out to, flew out to the States, met up with Jameson Lopp. Uh, we did an interview and then he took me to shoot guns and we got barbecue. And it was the first time I've ever shot a gun. I mean, that as an experience was great. Uh, I've got some standout interviews for me. My interview with Lynn Albrick, my first one, finding out about Ross was was really interesting. Um, I did one with Andrew Polstra from Blockstream, which is just a really great interview where it was totally unplanned. Um, uh, I just met him in Boston. And it just turned out into this like magical interview of like very technical, but a lot of fun. And then recently I just did an interview with Krista Rose and Junseth who did Bitcoin Uncensored and they hadn't seen each other for like a year and a half or something and fell out. But we recorded this great interview together, with the, which a lot of people seem to really enjoy. So, yeah. so yeah, they're some of my favorite. What about you? What, what's your favorites? Oh, geez. I mean, when Charlie Lee came to Australia, that was absolutely crazy during the height of the bull market. Had six or 700 people turn up to this, this meetup with a few days' notice. Um, wow. Oh, geez. I'm trying to think. We've had so many amazing guests. And we've just, because we're one of the smaller YouTube channels, we're 40 something um, thousand subs now. But during the bull market, we were just another low tier mid YouTuber. So we were only just starting to really land some really good, reputable guests now. And we've built up a trusted brand uh, with everything we're doing. But I guess for me, I, I got invited to speak to the Australian government about regulation. So that was probably a highlight for what? me. What? Yeah. Wow. Mm. Yeah. That's pretty badass. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not. So, I'm not too much of a badass, but it was pretty cool. So you on this full time? Yes. So I quit my job as a pharmacist uh, in mid December 2017, and my wife said, what? "Right at the top." My wife said, "You're not allowed to quit. We've got our wedding to pay for, and we're about to have you know try and have a family and stuff like that." And I thought, "Nah, like I'm so unhappy at work. I have to chase my passion." And if you had have told oh, me that. Um, we were going to go into a 15 month bear market and crypto was going to go down 90%. I probably wouldn't have quit. But uh, yeah, we've got a great team and we managed to make it work. So it's all going well. <laughs> so you've got a team? Yeah, so we, we do a lot of premium services and education as well. Um, and we've got a really loyal, right, okay. loyal following, which is our main source of revenue. So I've got a cool little team and uh, yeah, that's what we do. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Back to you though, Pete. <laughs> Let, <laughs> let's talk about some of the, the. I don't like talking about me. some of the um, most interesting businesses you've seen, startups, and you know I want people to understand how hard it is to run a tech startup, let alone a crypto tech startup. Kind of like what we're talking yeah. about before. People don't realize that when I say ninety nine percent of these are going to fail, they think I'm joking. Oh, I mean, some of the most interesting ones are, I mean, not just a. Th- not just to promote my sponsors, but I get to know these businesses because they are sponsors. And I think Kraken as a business, like as an exchange, is incredible. They've got a distributed team of something like 800 people all around the world and all coordinating and working together just because of the way technology announces them. I think it's amazing the way they've done that. It's like incredible. And I think they've got great leadership under Jesse Powell. Um, I'm a big fan of Casa. They're not a sponsor. I love what Casa are doing. I love the Casa node. I think that was one of the most amazing bits of marketing. I think that's a great business. I find Block BlockFi super interesting, who are a sponsor. You know, they're creating financial products, interest accounts and savings accounts. I mean, I just want the day where I have a bank account, which is my pounds next to my Bitcoin, and I can mix and match and move between them. That's that's what I want. Yeah, I mean, for people at home, I like BlockFi as well. I think they're becoming really popular if you look at the amount of revenue they're, they're doing now. Uh, the Casa node, for those that don't know, is a little plug-in box um, that is a Bitcoin node, and they have a Lightning node now as well. Pete's got one there in the background. And the first one you mentioned yeah. was, uh, was, was Kraken, which is super interesting as well because Bitfinex and BitMEX are always in the news. But Kraken's been there for a few years, just quietly doing its thing, and they do offer margin. They've got a decent range of coins, and they're pretty professional. I just think they're really trustworthy. They've got so much focus on security. And, uh, yeah, I trust them implicitly. Yeah, fantastic. So what's next for you, Pete? Are you going to keep doing this for the foreseeable future? Yeah, I mean, there's there's more I want to do. So I, I want to launch another podcast. I've been trying to do it for now a year. It's uh, just just dragging on uh, it's finding the time but i want to do a non-bitcoin podcast but subjects that bitcoiners are interested in censorship and freedom and sex workers and all the things that are like on the edge of bitcoin because i've met so many people i 
I want to talk to an interview and I don't always want to ask about Bitcoin. So I'd like to do that. And I want to start making more video content. I, I kind of think I might have some kind of documentary in me, but I'm not sure if I'm how good I am at that. Oh, so, we, But I'd like to challenge myself and try it. We made our first documentary about the Australian housing market last year and it was so much fun. I'd really encourage oh, yeah? you to do that. Can so. I watch it? How do I see it? Yeah, it's our most watched video on YouTube. So it's got 160-something thousand views now. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I'd encourage you to do that, mate. Follow your passion. And it's funny you say yeah. that you can talk about Bitcoin as these other things. I mean, if I didn't know that you were into crypto and open-minded, we wouldn't have been able to speak so comfortably about addiction or these other topics. And I go to a crypto meetup and there's people talking about you know, the GFC or 9-11 and their theories. And there's just all these open-minded people that want to question everything. And The Matrix is my favorite movie because of the whole get out of this nine to five matrix and question things. What a movie, man. <laughs> that film, blew, I remember the first, like there's a few films in time where you watch and you're just like, whoa, that was one. Terminator 2 was one. You'll be a bit too young for seeing that. You would have been about four when that came out. I have um, seen it a few times, so yeah. But they, 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 yeah, they sometimes they only work if you at the time if you see it at the time it comes out, like like the Matrix, like um, what's the one the Alien film Avatar Avatar Yeah, there's certain films that just will always blow you away. But I think Matrix when it came out, I think that just owned everyone. I think everyone just went, "What the fuck?" Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm with you with that one, man. So what, what does the crypto space need, Pete? And I actually think it's funny because it sounds really really stupid, but podcasts and you know getting these uh, subjects being talked about for average people to absorb is sort of getting over that barrier between the techies and the average person. And we need more average people to get into this space. Um, in pharmacy, there's a stat that uh, women spend you know 90% of the household budget on groceries and healthcare and things, and yet there's like 4% of women in crypto, which is a currency we want people to spend. So there's all these barriers we have to overcome. So what do you think the main thing is that the crypto space needs? I think just more education, just more simple, better education. Get people over that thinking it's just some funny fake internet money and thinking, you know, not understanding why this is important and the difference it can make to their lives. I think education is, is key because it, and these are tough subjects to get your head around. Yeah, and if you give one piece of advice to someone, a, a newbie that's watching watching this, uh, one the number one thing you've learned in crypto you wish you had known when you got into it? Only buy Bitcoin and hold it for 10 years at minimum. Fantastic. I think that's a great place to finish and your mic's died as well. But uh, Yeah, sorry about that. We, you, you jinxed us when you spoke about technical problems on the other side of the earth. I know, morning, I know. Pete. So I appreciate you uh, joining us today, mate, and we'll talk again soon. Anytime, man. Take care. Cheers, guys.